Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the astronomy instructor here at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, California. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome everyone here in the Smithwick Auditorium and everyone watching at home on the web to this lecture in the 14th annual Silicon Valley Astronomy Lecture Series. Uh, these lectures are made possible by NASA's Ames Research Center, the Foothill College Astronomy Program, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the SETI Institute, all of which do a great deal of work in outreach in astronomy uh, and endorse and support the spirit of these lectures, which is to share astronomy with a wider public. Uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. Roger Romani of Stanford University. Uh, uh, Dr. Romani is a professor of physics and a member of the Kavli Institute at Stanford. His research focuses on neutron stars and black holes, the corpses of stars. He enjoys finding new strange phenomena in the sky and then building theoretical models to explain them. Past recognition for his work includes the Sloan Foundation and Cottrell Scholars Fellowships and the prestigious Rossi Prize of the American Astronomical Society. Uh, Dr. Romani is also a well-known public speaker, and he wanted me to mention that he has uh, diverse credentials in astronomy. Uh, his work ranges across the entire spectrum of possible photons, from the radio spectrum all the way to the high energy gamma ray spectrum. And he says he's never met a photon he didn't like. Um, uh, so it's a, for me a, both a pleasure and an honor to be able to introduce to you discussing black widow pulsars, the vengeful corpses of stars, Dr. Roger Romani. Thank you, Andy, and welcome all. Now, I adhere to the peripatetic school of lecturing, and so I, my tendency is to wander a bit. I will try to cleave to the microphone to make sure that I stay on tape. Let me go ahead and start our discussion tonight. I hope we don't have too many arachnophobes in the audience, but I promise I won't show too many spider pictures. The story I want to tell you tonight is one that starts off as a story of a quest for discovery, a real survey of the sky. But then it turns into a missing persons mystery followed by a story of murder and cannibalism, at least in a stellar sense. But it ends happily with an opportunity to use the objects that we study to do fundamental physics, to really learn some deep truths about nature. So we're going to be ranging quite widely across the fields of astrophysics and physics tonight. And I hope that these objects, gamma ray black widows, will inspire you to think a little more deeply about the extremes of nature. OK. To start, we started a program of about 10 years ago of trying to study the highest energy photons in the sky, gamma rays. And it's a program NASA sponsored, but also the Department of Energy. And this project involved putting an instrument into space. Uh, is this pointer bright enough for you all? If it is, let's continue. This instrument would have to be strapped on top of a rocket. And so it's a bit, it's compelling but a bit disturbing when you put five to 10 years of your life into building a thing and you put it on top of a bomb and light the fuse. But of course, it ended up One quite zero happily. and liftoff of the Delta rocket carrying blast, a gamma ray telescope searching for unseen physics in the stars of the galaxy. Let's not let the NASA announcer go on too long, but it's an exciting period about five years ago when the mission finally got up into space and we put the thing onto orbit and started our survey of the gamma ray sky. Now, I want to start by telling you the sort of objects that we find, and then we'll continue on to the sort of objects that we saw but didn't understand. So here's a picture of our instrument. It's called Fermi now. It was originally called GLAST at launch, but as NASA tends to do, once they're successful, it's renamed after somebody famous. The Fermi mission here is um, in orbit, and it's been observing the sky now for about five years. And during those observations, ooh, could we have the lights down even a bit further on the screen? Is that possible? If it is, you might be able to see the background sky. As in many astronomical talks, the background is dark and the objects are light. So not the audience, but the screen would be ideal. <laughs> Thank you. That looks great. So now you get a picture of what we could see if we had gamma ray eyes. 
Now, this is the whole sky presented to you here, unfolded out into a single projection. This is the plane of the Milky Way, and there's various dots of gamma ray emission. The emission here has been color-coded by energy, red, green, and blue, corresponding to low energy for gamma rays, medium energy, and really high energy gamma rays. And this is what Fermi sees when it looks at the sky, at least in a time average sense. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, I would like to tell you what this gamma ray sky survey has uncovered. The first thing you notice is this diffuse kind of glow. Well, that's the plane of the Milky Way with the center of our galaxy right about here. And that diffuse glow comes from basically high energy particle collisions. Relativistic high energy protons are accelerated in space in a variety of ways. And when they go wandering through the galaxy and hit the, hit the interstellar medium, the gas between the stars, those collisions create high energy particles, including the famous pions, and those decay into gamma rays which we see. So that's a diffuse glow. But in addition, most of you probably notice these little dots of light. Those dots of light are individual sources pumping out gamma rays at ferocious energies. And it turns out that they are dominated by two classes of objects. It turns out that one class of objects we see is made up of powered by black holes. Now, you see this little uh, UPI? That stands for unipolar inductor. I'm gonna teach you a little bit of physics as we go through today. It turns out a spinning sphere seems to be a very important and dominant way of producing high energy gamma rays. But that sphere can be one of two kinds of objects. It can be a black hole, in which case the object is known as a blazar. I'll explain those a bit more in a minute. But it can also be what's called a neutron star. And if that kind of object is spinning, the, the power that comes out is in the form of pulsations, and we see it as an object we call a pulsar. So in fact, some of these objects that we see in the gamma ray sky are spin-powered black holes, like this one right here. Others are spin-powered neutron stars, like this one right there. Now the black holes are enormous. They're masses of millions to billions of times the mass of our sun, located in the nuclei of, galaxy, uh, of external galaxies. The pulsars, in contrast, are the dead corpses of relatively normal, heavier than the sun, but otherwise normalish stars. Masses of, haha, -ha, that's going to be the punchline of the talk, so we'll hold off on that. So here we go. First, let me tell you a little bit about what that first class of objects is, the blazars. As I said, blazars are located deep in the cores of external galaxies. They're supermassive black holes that have collapsed out of the cores. And accretion, flow of matter onto the surface of those black holes, is spinning them up. So if you look at this little animation, look right down at the center as the accretion just swirls material around and it falls on the black hole, you get the impression from this artist's rendition that the center of object is spinning, is spinning very rapidly indeed. Now it turns out that that spin is crucial because the spin, the energy that's put by accretion into the black hole makes a flywheel. And that flywheel holds lots of power and as it bleeds it out over cosmic periods of time, in this case many millions to billions of years, that power is converted into gamma rays. Now, a spinning sphere making power is also the subject of the second class of objects, the pulsars. In this case, as I said, it's a, it's a corpse of a normal star, a heavier star, about 10 times the mass of our sun. When the core of that star collapses down, it forms what's called a neutron star, about 10 kilometers across, about city-sized. The spin periods of these objects vary from the fastest being about a thousandth of a second to the ones that we see that are relatively slow are five or 10 seconds. And the basic mechanism behind the pulsations is, of course, very well known. You've got some sort of magnetic field structure, and in some completely almost mysterious way that I and my colleagues have been working on for 40 years or so now, it accelerates particles to enormous energy, and those particles in turn generate beams of radiation. That is complicated. But the basic thing that makes them pulse is simple. Those beams are tied to that magnetic field, and as the magnetic field rotates, they sweep across the Earth line of sight, giving rise to pulses of radiation. So the magnetosphere is mysterious and we enjoy discovering it, but the mechanism behind pulsations is pretty straightforward. Now what you see in the middle here is an artist's rendition of a spinning neutron star, and what you see over on the right is an image I made from data from the Fermi, uh, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. I took data from a piece of the galaxy, which you can see over here as this faint glow, and I folded it at the period of a particular pulsar, the famous Vela pulsar, which flashes about 10 times a second, rotates about 10 times a second. And I deconvolved with energy smoothing the gamma rays that are coming from that object. And you can see it there pulsing off and on. If you look carefully, you may notice that it's not a single burst per period. It kind of does you a double flash. 
and then a double flash. So what's going on there is a little more complicated than just a single beacon coming out of the pole of the star. But the basic story is correct. A spinning neutron star stores energy as a flywheel and then bleeds it out over millions of years in the form of high energy particles and gamma rays. Okay, those, those two classes of objects are the main things we see in the gamma ray sky. So here's a little bit of physics. I don't want to put many equations in this talk, so don't worry, but I do want to give you the basic idea of what we're studying. You, you see, when you have a sphere that's conducting and you embed it in a magnetic field and spin it, it makes a kind of a motor. In fact, Michael Faraday was the first to, back in the early 19th century, was the first to discuss this. A, a Faraday disk or a unipolar inductor or homopolar generator, they're all names for this basic phenomenon. A spinning, conducting disk in a magnetic field generates voltage and that voltage can accelerate particles. So remember, there are two classes of these things. The first is the blazar. If you have a spinning black hole, well, there's something important about black holes that we all know, and that is that they're black. They're black because nothing can come out of them. Well, yes, you can have the gravitational field of the object, and the external metric is affected if the object is spinning, but you, black holes have no hair, as the famous theory of the 1960s says. There's no other information that comes out of the surface of them, they're bald in that sense. So when I speak of a magnetic field coupled to a black hole, it must be a magnetic field that is externally supported. In this case, remember I refer to this accretion disk in the center of the galaxy where material's flowing onto the black hole? Well, in this case, that disk is the font and support for the magnetic field. Now, it holds a magnetic field that can be pushed into the black hole, as this little diagram suggests here, but the important thing is that it can't be locked to the black hole itself. What's happening here is that the black hole is spinning in the presence of a field which ends up aligning itself with the black hole. Now, the beauty of this is that it's axially symmetric. As it rotates, it looks the same from all directions. Well, all directions about a single axis. So these are 2D structures, and what you tend to get is a disk spinning around the black hole and a jet of radiation powered coming out of the north and south direction. Now, if that jet of radiation points at you, then it's very bright, it's a blazar. In contrast, if you have a neutron star, it's not a black hole, it's on the edge of becoming a black hole, it's very compact, very compressed, but it still has a surface. Neutron stars are not black. And because of that, you can have a magnetic field locked in that surface, and that magnetic field can therefore be internally supported. That means, in turn, that in general, it's gonna take some angle with respect to the spin axis. So if this is the spin axis, the magnetic field will point off at some angle, which we traditionally call alpha in this business. But what's more important is now you've gotta imagine us here at Earth looking at this thing in some distant place. We look at a, another angle. Let's call that zeta. Here's the line of sight denoted by a little eyeball sweeping across. And as you look at this system from different directions, you expect to see different pulses, different formation of the pulsar emission. And so this is a more complicated problem. The black hole problem is 2D. This is truly 3D. And while it's not the subject of today's lecture, that's one of the main things that my research group has occupied itself with the results of this Fermi mission. But today's lecture is gonna focus on a very peculiar class of these gamma ray producing objects. It's a very peculiar class of spin powered pulsars. Now, you might ask yourself, how can we tell these two things apart? I showed you a picture of the gamma ray sky and it was just a bunch of dots. How can you tell which is which? Well, we have our ways. And here's one way in which you can do it. If you look at this little animation, you may have noticed these two objects circled here, which are in fact the two I pointed to you before. These are images that are going, well, as when the animation was running, they were images spaced about a month apart. And if you recall, when you were looking at that picture, you saw that this object seemed to flash off and on to vary month to month whereas this object was relatively steady, at least averaged over a time period of several days. Okay, what that means is that variable objects in the sky can be distinguished from steady ones. And it turns out the blazars, the things with the jets, they flare and vary on the week to month time scale. Pulsars, in contrast, once you average over that spin, the pulsations, they're very, very steady. So that's one way to distinguish these two classes of objects. Another way goes back to that original kind of image of the sky I showed you that was color-coded by gamma ray energy. It turns out if you take the gamma ray spectrum as a function of energy and look at how much light's coming out, we call that a spectrum. I'm gonna just subdivide it into red, green, and blue, low, medium, and high energy gamma rays. 
It turns out, for reasons that needn't occupy us too much here, that the blazars, the black hole systems, are, I guess, white. Well, really, they're either sort of pink, i.e. a little more red, or blue, pale blue. They have a little more blue than red. They're basically what we call power laws, straight lines in these spectrum plots. So that's a way of distinguishing a black hole by its spectrum. In contrast, the pulsar, the neutron star systems, are green. They end up being very, relatively faint and low energies, peaking in the middle of the Fermi band, and then fading away as you go to high energies. By the way, they're very green in a sort of ecological sense as well. It turns out that this flywheel that's going along can put tens of percents of its power into gamma rays. So they're the most efficient gamma ray sources that we know of in the sky, the Priuses of the astrophysics world, if you will. Okay, so here we're starting to come to a bit of a mystery. When I got working on this mission a few years ago, I decided what I really wanted to do was understand the content of the gamma ray sky. And so I set myself a task. We took the bright source list, the ones that came right off the, the font when the missions first started, the brightest 250 so the things, dots that were there in the sky, and said, I want to understand what every darn one of these is. And so here's what I did. I, we took the radiation in gamma rays from these two kinds of objects and plotted it as scientists do. When you got two numbers, you plot one versus the other. So variability goes up this way, getting more variable in this direction. And color, we'll call it greenness, increases in this direction. And if you look on this plot, you can see a bunch of dots, those 250 brightest gamma ray sources in the sky, and they kind of fall into two general clumps. There's this whitish, or well, really black outline set of clumps. Those are the blazars. They're very variable, and they're relatively white, not very green. In contrast, there's a set of clumps out this direction, which are not variable at all, but they're relatively green, relatively curved spectrum. Those are the pulsars. But when I started this project, after we'd done all the standard techniques, which I will review for you briefly, of checking what kind of object we have, we found that out of these 250, there were six that we didn't know what they were. Six remained unidentified after about three years of work on the gamma ray sky. Now, those are these things in a red dots, and if you've been following the story I've been telling you, the fact that they lie in this clump of green dots makes you suggest they're at least related to pulsars. But as I'll show you shortly, all the standard ways of finding pulsars didn't work for these. They're unidentified. I got excited because it's usually true when you work very hard to check for normal things and the objects don't turn out to be normal, you've got a real chance of discovering something new, unusual, and possibly important. And so that was the quest here. Take the handful of objects that were remaining and work incredibly hard to see if we can figure out what they are. Now that's a couple years of work already, and I'm sorry to say that we're only half done, but it's been a fun half already, so I'll tell you about that. So the six remaining unidentified we're gonna call Fermi's missing half dozen. And here they are on the gamma ray sky again. Here we plotted the positions of those six objects. And if the, and this, theater were really dark, you could probably see their little dots within these. Those are the actual gamma ray sources, and they lie spread across the sky, some near the plane of the galaxy, some farther away. That's those half dozen sources that I'll be talking about for the next few minutes. So, we've already described to you how from the color and the lack of variability, they look like pulsars. So the natural thing we all did when we first saw these things was to try to find pulsars at the positions of these objects. Now, how does one do that? Well, for the, the specialists among you, those who amateur astronomers, know that pulsars are very traditionally found by radio emission. And what you do is you take a relatively large radio telescope, like the Green Bank Telescope, 100 meters across, or even bigger, the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico, 305 meters across, and you look for pulsating radio signals coming from it. That's a great technique, and it's worked, all oh, these gamma ray sources, worked about 100 times already. So we found pulsing radio sources in a large number of the gamma ray sources on the sky. But these six did not yield radio pulsations, okay? So it failed one test. Well, one of the great things Fermi taught us is that some pulsars, the radio beam seems to miss the Earth while the gamma ray beam still sweeps across us. So perhaps they're pulsing only in the gamma rays. That too has been a subject of search and it's kind of difficult because as excited as I am about these gamma ray photons, you should probably remember that gamma rays, such as Fermi sees, are enormously energetic, about a billion times the energy of the visible light in this room, but they're very rare. Even one of these powerful pulsars delivers to Fermi this, you know, uh, car-sized object, this car-sized telescope in the sky, it only gets of order one photon a day. 
And during that one day, the object may have spun around thousands or perhaps even millions or even tens of millions of times. And you gotta figure out how to stack up all those photons to see if you can find out a pulse. It's a challenge and it requires enormous supercomputer searches. So a gamma ray supercomputer search is kind of tricky. I've got a little animation that may illustrate that for you. Let's see if I can get my cursor. Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> so here we go. So what you need to do is you need to move to a position on the sky, take all the photons from that position, stack them up, and just try a whole mess of periods. That doesn't look like much, does it? And so you move the, to another position on the sky, recompute the arrival times of all the photons, stack them up, and try a whole bunch of periods again. And that doesn't look like much either. And you continue to do this for, with the largest supercomputer clusters that we've been able to get to for weeks, months, in some cases, years. And not much is often seen, but when you hit it, it's obvious. Because all the photons coming from this object stack up into narrow peaks Narrow pulsations, you get excited, you write your paper, you get tenure if you're a young assistant professor. There you go. Okay, let's stop that. So that technique has been employed to search the gamma ray photons of a large, of a number of those sources, and that too has worked. In fact, about 40 times before on the gamma ray sky. But it failed for those six, aha. Uh -huh. So now we're getting suspicious. That didn't work. Perhaps those unidentified sources are something weird, something special, something different. So now we come to the part of the story that is um, connecting a little more to classical astronomy. How do we go about chasing these things down? So once again, remember this map of the gamma ray sky that I showed you? It turns out that if you're gonna be looking for the counterpart of a gamma ray source to try to figure out what it is at lower energies, life gets a lot easier if you're not too close to the Milky Way. Because as you all know, the Milky Way is just crowded with interesting stuff. And so objects that are close to the Milky Way, you have to sift through thousands and thousands of possible counterparts before you can find something that's plausible. Makes it very difficult. So in this quest, we started with the objects furthest from the Milky Way. And that of the six is the furthest one down there. So what we did is we took the furthest object that had the best localized, smallest uncertainty region and tried to figure out what was inside that. Now, the words uncertainty region may seem a little bit weird to you. I think you're used to when you see an object on the sky, you know where it is. You've already done the problem. But alas, gamma ray telescopes don't quite work that way. It turns out that gamma ray telescopes can't focus the light at all. After all, gamma rays are even more powerful, even more penetrating than x-rays. And so they go smashing right through any device that you build. There is essentially no way of bringing the gamma rays to a focus and making a direct image. Instead, what you do with a gamma ray telescope like the Fermi Lat is you use that smashing power to actually have the gamma rays penetrate the telescope, collide with dense material, tungsten in this case, and that tungsten, in, in the presence of the tungsten, the gamma rays materialize into an electron-positron pair, which goes smashing through the rest of the detector. And since the electrons and positrons are charged, you can track them. So what we do is we have a tracker that actually sees the materialized matter-antimatter pair from this gamma ray and follows the shower of particles coming off from it, projects back along that shower to say, aha, my gamma ray came from there in the sky. Oh, it's a great idea, it works. But alas, it doesn't work incredibly sharply. Our best gamma ray vision still gives us a large region of uncertainty. And in a typical gamma ray uh, astronomical optical photograph, there would see, you can see, I think, given the lighting here, a handful of objects in that, but there are many, many thousands of stars with this uncertainty region, which is a good fraction of the size of the moon. So we have a large area to discover to, and to survey to see what's inside of it. Now, we can help things a bit by using lower energy photons, x-rays in this particular case, and it focuses our attention on a handful of objects, a dozen or so. But then what we really want to do is go to optical, visible light telescopes and chase down what the counterparts are. And now I want to show you how we did that for this particular object, has, which has this strange telephone number, its position on the sky, J2339-0533. This one was a lot of fun because I got to do a bit of a stunt. I got to use the very largest telescope I had at Stanford and the smallest one that we had access to. I took our teaching observatory, you can see this little photograph of the observatory where our students learn how to do astronomy and how to measure images. It's a 24-inch, relatively small, 0.6-meter telescope, but it was just big enough 
to see the star corresponding to this object. So we choose that telescope to watch the star and watch it changing. As it turns out, it brightens and fades dramatically over, the, over a period of hours. Unfortunately, in a physics, astrophysics really, you need to not just look at objects and measure their colors. You really have to break up the light into a spectrum to understand what they're all about. And the spectrum of an object takes a lot more light and a lot larger telescope. So I used our larger telescope, the Hobby Everly telescope. It's about a 10 meter telescope down in West Texas that we were partners of at the time. And I used that. And here's the relative collecting power of the 0.6 meter. And this is the area of the mirror of the 9.2 meter HET. And I used that to measure the spectrum of the star. Well, let's see what we found. First of all, let me show you some images that I took at the Kitt Peak National Observatory of this object. This is a sequence of images um, stacked up over the orbital, spin, this orbital period of this object, which is about four and a half hours. I've actually gone ahead and color-coded them so they look a little more attractive. Um, the filters in the original photographs at the Kitt Peak Observatory were green, red, and infrared, but I've converted it to blue, green, and red, so it makes a common photograph. So here's a honking bright star. This one's about eighth magnitude, bright enough that for you amateur astronomers, you know, it's quite visible in a nice pair of binoculars. And here's the target that we're gunning for right there. That's the variable object. Now, if you look carefully, you'll notice at first it fades and gets redder. Those of you at least up front can hopefully see it. And then gets brighter and bluer. I don't know if anybody else has noticed something peculiar. Take a look what's going on up here. <laughs> see a little object marching through? A little sequence of R, green, and B, red, green, and blue. That's an asteroid. It turns out this particular object is right on the ecliptic, and darn it, every time I've observed this thing, there's asteroids coming through the field all the time. In fact, quite depressingly, last time I observed it down at Saratololo Observatory uh, this past summer, an asteroid went within the seeing disk right through the object during the middle of observations, destroying the photometry. So um, observing this one's always a bit of a challenge because you get these little funny extra objects to discover in the background as you're, as you're watching it. But in any case, the main phenomenon I want you to pay attention to is the brightening and fading of this object. It's pretty spectacular. It brightens and fades by about a factor of 30 as of over two and a half hours. So the full orbital period, four and a half hours, takes it from very bright and blue to very faint and red. Now, remember, the physics, which we won't go to in detail, the, the undetailed understanding of these objects come from the spectra. And for amateur astronomers, you know that star spectra are closely coupled to the temperature. We have the famous sequence, OBAF, OB a fine girl kiss me, that we all remember from our student days. Well, this object gives us a little lesson in stellar spectroscopy because it sweeps from the M class up to the F class and back again in four and a half hours. So as we observed it with a telescope, we saw a sequence of spectra which varied from M class stars up to an F class and right back down again. And you can just watch it changing stellar spectral type over the period of a couple of hours. Now, with those spectra, what you really want to do as astrophysicists is you want to measure the composition the, from the Doppler shifts, the motion, the masses of the objects. And that's what we did. Here's what we found. The Doppler shifts of the object that is going around this gamma ray source shows us two things. One, it shows us that the object going around the gamma ray source is being heated on one side. Now, the story is pretty straightforward. You saw it very hot and blue at half of the phase, and when you go half a period later, it's very faint and red. So the object itself, this companion of the heater, of the gamma ray source, is some little low mass pathetic red star, but it's being blasted and heated up to very high temperatures on the front side. And the spectra show that. What they also do is by measuring the Doppler shift of that heated object as it swirls around the star, it gives you an idea of the masses. And in fact, it turns out that the heating source is about 1.8 times the mass of our sun, and the other object is about a third of the mass of our sun, okay? Hold on to that thought. That's gonna be useful in a few minutes when we come on to the next few objects. So we measured the temperature, and we saw it going from about 3,000 degrees up to 7,000 degrees or so. That was the first of the, of the six objects. I wanna tell you about the second now. We had to work our way a little closer to the plane of the galaxy, and the second one turned out to be not so bright, so I had to use both the wind telescope at Kitt Peak National Observatory and another four-meter class telescope, SOAR, down in Chile, to observe this object. When we observed it, this is what we found. Once again, it's varying dramatically over a short period. Now, a really short period, 93 minutes, 93.7 minutes. This turns out to be the shortest orbital period of any spin-powered object known. 
And it's great fun at the telescope because over the period of an hour and a half, the thing comes and goes and comes and goes, varying in flux by a factor of, in this case, a factor of 50 or so. So once again, you can kind of make pictures of it at maximum when it's hot and blue, and at minimum where I bet out there you can't even see it, but it's really faint and red. So there we go. In this case, it's heated up to the incredible temperature of 14,000 degrees from nearly invisible at minimum. Now, just like in the case of the first optic where you could see it with a modest sized telescope to really study it, you needed a big gun. Here, it took a four meter telescope just to measure it. We needed the biggest telescopes on the planet to measure the spectrum. So I and some colleagues, oh yes, you're gonna see Alex uh, next time you come here. So this is work I've done with Alex Filipenko and, and his postdoc, Brad Schenko. Um, we used the Keck telescopes in Hawaii to discover this, to study the spectrum of this object. It's an ongoing project that Alex and I have. And this one turned out to be really, really remarkable, even stranger than the other. First thing, the object going around the heater, the power source, was incredibly light, only about a hundredth the mass of our sun, or 10 times the mass of Jupiter. Really small. Second, the power source itself seemed to be remarkably heavy. This has been tough to pin down, but it seems to be more than about two and a half times the mass of our sun, even heavier than the previous one. And the spectra were absolutely bizarre. This is, of course, kind of for the specialists. When you look at stellar spectra, it's not for the standard audience. But let me tell you one thing we found that was really remarkable. Well, the first thing is that it's, it has essentially no hydrogen. Now, remember, hydrogen is by far the most common element in the universe. And the vast majority of stars are mostly made up of hydrogen. Somehow, this remnant, this 100th of a solar mass, got stripped of almost all of its hydrogen, essentially all of its hydrogen. And the main thing left behind was helium and heavier elements. Essentially, no hydrogen is there. The normal emission lines of hydrogen, visible on the top blue trace, are invisible on the bottom black trace. Less than one one hundredth of thousandth of the hydrogen that you expect. The other thing, of course, is that we've uh, got masses as well as the composition. So now we're going to ask ourselves, we've found this thing making gamma rays, which is heating up this little thing that's going around it, and the nature of that power source is the key question. Well. If you've been paying attention, you know I already have a hint that it's probably a spinning neutron star, a pulsar. And indeed, that's going to be the case. After we figured out what these binaries were doing, Doppler shifting, it took that supercomputer project, which failed repeatedly before, and narrowed down the possible range of things, the Doppler shifts and positions that they had to check enough that it was possible for both these objects to confirm that there actually are gamma ray pulsars. But the remarkable thing is that their pulsar is spinning very fast spin periods of only a few milliseconds. So they're very, very powerful, as well as being incredibly fastly, rapidly Doppler shifted as they go around the companion stars. Shortest periods known. Okay, finally we did manage to also detect the other classical signature of these kind of pulsars, radio pulsations. But here too it was also very peculiar. We only found them after going back to the telescope repeatedly, in one case 20 times before we saw it even once. So the radio pulsations are almost never visible. What's that about? Well, hang on there. The solution seems to be that these are millisecond pulsars, but they're incredibly highly obscured. There are a class of objects that we call millisecond pulsars that, because they're fast, but they're a special class of millisecond pulsars, the Black Widows, the subject of today's lecture. So before I do that, it turns out every pulsar astronomer's got to show this plot. And ye, even for a non-technical audience, I think it teaches you a lot. What we're plotting on the horizontal axis is how fast the thing is spinning. Here's a period of one second. Over on this end is a period of a thousandth of a second, a millisecond. And on this axis is how fast the spin is changing. It turns out that those two quantities map to how powerful the source is. If you're up near these top lines, they're high power sources, and then over time they fade away in this direction. The colored dots represent the objects that Fermi has seen. And they come in two classes. It seems that when pulsars are first born, they're born at periods of a few hundredths of a second. Here, high power, low power. They start off at high power, and then they spin down over perhaps 10 million years. For the first million years or so, they can give off gamma rays. And then the spinning dynamo gets weak enough that they can't accelerate particles, and it fades. Yeah, they still emit radio waves until after about 10 million years or so, they disappear completely into what we call the pulsar graveyard. The dead cinder of the star just sits there, unless it's fortunate to have a companion. If it's born in a binary, as many stars are, sometimes that companion can resurrect it, give it life again, by transferring matter on and spinning the thing back up again, very much like those black holes in the centers of galaxies that we showed you earlier. 
If it spins up, the thing can be reborn as a millisecond short period pulsar and then spin itself down over periods, in this case, of billions of years, lasting a very long time. So remember the red dots. Fermi sees the most energetic pulsars of this class of things. So here's that pulsar resurrection scenario. Take a look at our little animation here. We've got a neutron star buried in here, a companion star with an accretion disk. Material is flowing down onto that companion star. And as it flows down onto the companion star, the beams of radiation, which here denote the poles, the magnetic poles, have material flowing into them and it spins the star up. It's kind of like the reverse of, you know, when you have a sprinkler and the, and the water is coming off the end of it, slowing it down. Here, the material is flowing in and spinning it up so it's going faster and faster and faster. And during this accretion phase, as material flows onto the star, you can get it up to these millisecond kind of periods. And that powers up the battery, powers up the flywheel, and once the dust and light and accretion disk have cleared away, the remaining object can be a reborn millisecond pulsar. So the story of the discovery of the first of these millisecond pulsars was a great one. I, I remember this very well. I was an undergraduate at the time, and it was very exciting to me because I knew enough about pulsars to know that they came in, that when they were born, there were maybe a few hundredths of a second. You know, a thirtieth of a second was the fastest one known. In fact, the pulsar in the Crab Nebula there was the fastest pulsar known. So I'll give you a little audio for a second. If you take a radio telescope, when we study things professionally, we make all sorts of plots, but when you think of a radio antenna, you usually think of hooking it up to a speaker, right? If you do that when you're pointing it at the crab pulsar, this is what you hear. That's enough of that. That was rather loud. <laughs> and that is the fastest known pulsar at the time in 1982 when this discovery was made. So that's the crab in the center of the crab nebula. However, if you hook up to an antenna and look at the direction of this guy, 1937 plus 214, here you go, hold your ears. Okay, that was enough of that. <laughs> you almost couldn't hear the beats. It's a very high pitch because the frequency is so fast, 642 hertz, it's well within the audio zone. It's not just a set of pulses, it's a tone. It was shocking, it was amazing, it was exciting when this object was discovered. But the thing that was really amazing is we had some inkling of how you could get a pulsar fast, and that's the story I just told you. Material flows onto a star and spins it up. For that to work, it had better be a double star, a binary. This object was single. In splendid isolation, it was sitting there spinning at 642 hertz, 642 times a second, an object heavier than the sun. A very remarkable thing indeed. Okay. So we puzzled our heads a bit, and then about five years, ten years later, an example of an object that showed us the way in which this might come to be was found. And it was the first of this class of objects now known as Black Widow Pulsars. It's known 1957 plus 20, and it's a binary system. There's a companion going around the neutron star with a period of about nine hours. Now every nine hours, the neutron star or pulsar disappears behind that companion, and it disappears in a kind of blobby, variable way. It's clear the companion's got some kind of wind coming off of it. Material is being stripped off of the companion somehow by the radiation of this pulsar. Well now, so that's the idea. Perhaps this stripping or ablation takes the companion, whittles it down until there's nothing left, and you end up with a single millisecond pulsar. Alas, when you try to look at what's happening with this object, it can't seem to do it. It can't get the job done. Well, we're not going to give up on such a beautiful idea yet. I mean, yes, theories can be destroyed by the ugly truth, but we're going to hold on to them as long as possible. And so it's possible that more violent and more powerful black widows exist. That may still be the way in which you actually make single pulsars. So this story of cosmic ingratitude, of having a companion star donate the mass that regave the pulsar life, and then in horrible retribution being fried and evaporated back to nothing, is in fact, I would argue, the story of the objects that I've been showing you. Let me show you another animation. an animation that we generated at Goddard um, showing the particular object, 1311 minus 3430, that I described to you a second. It's a very short period system, remember, 94 minutes, about an hour and a half. The pulsar, the spinning object here, slowed down for your own enjoyment, you know, it's going around th almost a thousand times a second, is slamming radiation, beams of radiation into the companion star, which is heated white hot on the front, but it's very cold on the back. And it's also being stripped. A very powerful wind is being driven off this companion, which we see in our spectra as well. 
finally that powerful wind seems to pile up in a sort of a torus, a thick disc. Technical name in the field is an excretion disc instead of an accretion disc. And that excretion disc surrounding the system shrouds it, hides it. Well, you remember what gamma rays are. They're more powerful than x-rays. They're incredibly penetrating. It hides it from radio. It hides it from the low frequency way in which you would normally find a pulsar. But the gamma rays can punch right through. And so this object, this very tight object, is shown up in the form of gamma rays, whereas the radio signal is almost always blocked. Once in a blue moon, as we found by staring at it repeatedly, a little gap in that wind excretion disk occurs and a little bit of radio can get through, but we can almost never find it in the radio. Gamma rays were very much the key. Okay, that's enough of that animation. Onward. So, that's the story. The power from the pulsars is evaporating the companions, ripping material off, and perhaps even, in this case, whittling it down to nothing the gamma ray pulsar is destroying its mate. So this got some nice attention. There was an article in Sky and Telescope a few, uh, a few months ago, um, which kind of, just in time for Halloween, I guess, maybe that's why they liked it. Anyway, you can see this nice graphic of this fanciful, spiderish looking pulsar ripping apart its companion star. Okay. So that's part of the story. I think we've got a handle on what's going on with these mysterious half dozen objects. Two of them are incredibly tight binary, shrouded with this wind, hidden from the alveolar normal ways in which you would find a pulsar. But the penetrating gamma rays get through and give us the signpost of what's there. Is that the story for the rest? Well, remember the task gets harder and harder as you get closer to the Milky Way. We figured out that one first, we figured out that one second, and if you're looking down at our plot, well, he's next. So last summer when we went back down to Chile, we observed this particular object, and uh, this is not even published yet, so it's hot off the press. Um, this is even faster period. It looks like 70, under 75 minutes is the binary for this guy. And a quick look with the Keck telescope in September, it's lost behind the sun, but Alex and I will hit it again in, in uh, March when it comes back out. Shows it, it looks like it's another really high mass pulsar. So great, looks like the pattern's holding, and this one's the new record holder. So we're continuing to dig our way down to the shortest period things ever found. Okay, so maybe this is the origin of those single millisecond pulsars. Our objects are so powerful and such short periods that they seem to get the complete evaporation done and may end up with something single. But there's some other hints that that may happen. Many of you probably forget, you've heard over the last five, ten years, many, many talks, I hope, and at least news stories about the discovery of exoplanets, planets around other stars. We in the pulsar world are eager to remind you all that the first exoplanets ever found were actually going around one of these millisecond pulsars. My colleague Alex Wolshan found these. Um, and there are two, three actual planets, two planets and a moon-sized thing, going around a millisecond pulsar with this code name here. So they were the first known exoplanets. They may well be the dregs of this evaporation process. More recently, does anybody remember some news reports about the so-called diamond planet? That was kind of a sexy little story, but really what's going on here is it seems to be a planet made mostly of carbon, which if it's cold enough will crystallize. And once again, it's around one of these millisecond pulsars. So the stripping and evaporation and turning into single seems very effective, but occasionally it leaves a little debris behind. So that may indeed be the story. Now we're coming on towards the end of the talk, and I promised you that this story of destruction and retribution of this vengeful pulsar would have a little upside at the end, and that is a chance to actually do some fundamental physics. That's what I want to tell you about next. And it comes up back to a question. Well, we have a binary star, and the companion disappeared, but what happened to its mass? We need to get a full budget of what happened to the mass that started off in the pulsar's companion. Well, we knew some of it had to fall in the neutron star to spin it up. And we also see that in some cases, some of it's being blown away in this wind that's evaporating the remnants of the companion. The critical question is how much goes into each of those two channels? It turns out that these hidden black widows that I'm finding with Fermi are ultra short period, and they have to accrete an immense amount of matter before they can turn on powerfully enough to start ripping the companion away. Because they're so tight, the accretion is very, very strong. And this gives us an important hint that the Fermi Black Widows may accrete lots of mass before they turn on as millisecond pulsars. You've already seen a bit of a hint of that. Those of you who may remember, there's a classical number in astrophysics called the Chandrashekhar mass, 1.4 solar masses. 
It's the classical and typical mass that we find for most neutron stars. So your garden variety neutron star is about 1.4, for reasons I'll tell you in just a minute. The Fermi detected black widows that we see so far seem to be quite heavy. The standard ones are 1.7, and we even found one as heavy as 2.4 solar masses. But what about these shrouded, deeply buried, short period ones? 1311 minus 3430 seems to clock in at almost three solar masses. That number's still a little bit uncertain, but it's really, really heavy for a neutron star, twice as heavy as we expected it to be. And the critical question is, how much more mass can these things take? It's critical for a physics reason. And let's see if I can explain it to you. Here's a diagram plotting for you the logarithm of the density at the center of one of these neutron stars. Now, water's got a density of one, so this is 100,000 times the density of water, 10 to the 10th, 10 billion times the density of water and on up. But then when you get up about here, the density suddenly increases really fast with the mass highly gro hardly growing at all, and then there's an unstable branch here. So let's imagine we have an object here, whoop, whoop, go back, back, back. We have an object here and we start piling mass on it. The mass increases, it increases, but when it hits that period, it plummets, it drops off and becomes a neutron star. It reaches the next branch, the electrons disappear, they get sucked into the protons, you end up with a pure ball of nearly pure neutrons, and it appears on this branch of the diagram. That magic number is the famous Chandrasekhar mass. The maximum mass a white dwarf can have, 1.4 solar masses. This number is known exquisitely well. It depends on the physics of electrons, which we really understand very well indeed. So well that in advanced undergraduate courses, we show them how to calculate this number to a few percent precision. We know the Chandrasekhar mass. What we don't know is the equivalent number for neutron stars. You see, if you've been looking ahead, you've noticed that the same kind of curve occurs for the neutron stars. You pile more mass on, it gets heavier and heavier and denser and denser in the center, but somewhere between a low mass probability and a high mass possibility, it collapses and becomes a black hole. So the critical question then is, how heavy can it get? And that, in turn, determines the physics at ultra high densities, many times the density of a nucleus of an atom, denser than any material we can create here on Earth. It determines the physics of what's going on at those densities, the so-called equation of state. So deep inside neutron stars, things are very mysterious. We don't know what's going on, and the only way to study it is to see the neutron stars that are given us by nature. And here's where I think Fermi has given us a great gift. For the reasons that I tried to explain to you, it seems that the neutron stars that Fermi finds, those missing half dozen, seem to have suffered extra mass accretion. They've gotten more mass than your typical neutron star and have been pushed as close to that death limit of becoming a black hole as possible. And so the scientific quest I now have is to try to use measurements in the neutron stars to figure out this equation of state, to see if something really exotic is going on at the ultra high density limit in this part of the diagram. So, the last di couple diagrams here um, are a little bit technical, but I think it's fairly o it's easy to understand if you think about this as being the size of an object and this being its mass. It's related to that other diagram with density I showed you. But once again, here are theoretical curves, the so-called equation of state of nuclear matter. What happens when you put a bunch of nuclei together? And here is a bunch of theorist predictions. There's a wide range of predictions, and at most, Really, at most, one of those can be true. <laughs> we don't know which one, and it turns out that the study of neutron stars winnows the theoretical field immensely and puts many theorists out of business and gives a few a final lease on life. So here's how it works. The heaviest neutron stars known to date before we started this project clocked in at just under two solar masses. So a lot of exotic models hit the dustbin. The Fermi Black Widows that we're working on now, as I've told you, are coming in at about 2.2 to up to 2.8 solar masses. They're somewhere in this range. We're down to the last couple possibilities that people have proposed. Now, infinite is the flexibility of theorists, and as soon as we narrow it down to this range, I think that we will have a bunch of new models all clustering around that last remaining set of possibilities. But the thing is, it's exciting because it's ex very extreme. There's basic physics reasons that say you really can't get much heavier than this before you must become a black hole. And that indeed seems to be what nature does. So here's my last slide. My conclusion is this long story I've told you, this story of surveying the sky to find mysterious things in the gamma rays, tracing down the things we do find to see most of them are things we understand and a handful are weird in some way, studying those weird ones intensively to try to see what's special about them, 
and then learning something fundamentally new about the universe by studying those special objects. That, I believe, is the grand quest of astrophysics, is to look at the grand nature given us in the cosmos and to study it, to study the experiments that we couldn't possibly yet do here on Earth, to learn the physics of the 22nd, 23rd, and perhaps even 24th century. So with those thoughts, I would like to conclude, and I'd be happy to take a few questions. Yeah. Could you please explain the numbering mechanism and how you guys actually number these? Because it just seems a little abstract to me. Oh, those names that we gave them? Yes. Is there, oh, is there a method to your madness? There, there certainly is. Those are simply the coordinates on the sky in what we call right ascension, then hours, in one, hours and minutes in one direction, and degrees north and south of the equator in the other. So it's, it, they're rather, we refer to them as telephone numbers in astronomy. And that, you know, for the initiate, they're not a problem, but I, I probably should have explained that before I showed them to you. There's nothing special about it except that it gives you an approximate idea of where on the sky that thing is. Great, thank you. Sure. So I guess we're on the right now. Go ahead. The white dwarfs, mm -hmm. is it actually, what? Is it actually possible for a white dwarf to get over Chandrasekhar's limit, or does it have to turn into a neutron star? That's a very good question. Um, the basic theoretical modeling says that that Chandrasekhar limit is the limit of what you can do, but we've got to be just a little bit careful. It turns out that the white dwarf is spinning really fast. There, you've heard of centrifugal force? Yeah. That centrifugal force can kind of hold up a little bit of the mass, and you can get just a hair above Chandrasekhar's limit. Ah, uh, but it doesn't buy you much time. You pile a little more mass on, it's all over. Blammo. Neutron star. Okay. Inevitable. And I guess we're back on the left. Okay. So um, the, the beams that come out of the magnetic poles, like you know, how narrowly forecast are they? Like some of the earlier videos had showed them pretty wide. Like the, the picture there is pretty narrow. Do you have any sense of... Right. We do, and indeed that's been one of the main foci of my research is cal calculating that. It turns out that if you want to make pretty pictures, they've got to be kind of narrow because you want to see them sweeping across the sky like a lighthouse. In fact, the radio beam seems to be narrow. The gamma ray beam, in contrast, is what we call a fan beam. It actually spreads out and covers a good fraction of the sky, sweeping across with this thin hollow cone so we see a double pulse as it comes by. Probably it varies by the age of the pulsar, but between about half and down to perhaps a quarter of the sky is covered for every single pulsar. So by each beam, with two beams on each side, that goes to 100% down to maybe 50%. It's tricky to calculate in detail, but it, we think we know what's going on now. Yep, they're quite wide. Okay, thank you. The pictures are ugly, though, so I didn't show you one of those. <laughs> Back on the left, please. Um, when a new uh, star is reborn, um, be from another star that's already uh, making it reborn, what is flowing on to that star? Yeah, okay, so this resurrection or recycling process that I discussed is one of mass being drawn off by the gravitational field of the pulsar, very dense, very strong gravity, flowing from the surface of the other relatively normal star. So most of that mass is probably, like everything in the universe, hydrogen. As the hydrogen flows across and slams onto the neutron star, the immense pressure exerted by the gravitational force at the surface will crush that hydrogen down to denser and denser and heavier and heavier elements, going through a layer of helium, carbon, all the way up to krypton and then iron, and it finally dissolves into a sea of pure neutrons as it goes right down into the neutron star. It's a very violent process, and the skin of normal stuff on the surface is only about a centimeter thick. I spent two years of my graduate student life calculating what happens in that one centimeter, but it's still um, exciting things go on there. So normal matter, mostly at first, neutrons by the end. Thanks. Hi, uh, you had that graph with the diagonal lines and the two groups of pulsars, the millisecond and the regular. Why is it there's such a large gap between the lifetime of a regular pulsar and the lifetime of a millisecond? You were talking like 10 million versus in the billions. Yep, very good question. So most pulsars, when they're born, seem to have enormously strong magnetic fields, about a trillion times the Earth's magnetic field, 10 to the 12th-ish Gauss. That field takes that flywheel and spins it down pretty fast, about 10 million years to take yourself from a 30th of a second out to 
five or 10 seconds when the whole thing dies. I think they still live in some sense because the object's there, but they no longer emit the beams of radiation that let us find it. The accretion process, uh, now you're getting to something very near and dear to my own heart, uh, some, some theoretical work I did quite a few years ago. In addition to spinning it up, it seems to crush the magnetic field to bury it in the star mm -hmm. and lower that magnetic field by a large factor, going from trillions only down to maybe as few as 100 million, a few, as 100 million times the magnetic field of our Earth. That lets the coupling to the outside world be weaker, and you spin up the flywheel, giving it even more energy than you, you started with originally, and then it's dribbled out more slowly, so the pulsar can then last for billions, in some cases tens of billions, the full age of the universe. Can, the radio emission can still keep going. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, we do have somebody over here. Yes. So do, so neutron stars are primarily neutrons? Is there like a, a composition or a percentage of them that are neutrons compared to just normal matter? Okay, yes. Um, it, well, the detailed behavior of matter at high densities is one of the great puzzles that we're fighting for here. But before you reach these magic central densities where we're not sure what's going on, we think the theory is pretty solid. And what happens there is that you get a sea of mostly, but not 100% neutrons. You get about 1% protons, and for every proton you get an electron. And so the relatively, the mixture is mostly neutrons, hence the name neutron star. But there's this little admixture of protons. Now, the protons are great because protons and electrons, unlike neutrons, are charged. And because they're charged, they can hold that magnetic field, which was the font of all the excitement and the power that we're describing. So that teeny fraction of protons in there turns out to be very important indeed. It's what makes that magnetic field held into the star and what makes it possible. Indeed, they seem to be superconducting, superfluid neutrons and protons in the center. But until you get to the very central regions where the density gets about three to five times the density of normal nuclei, that's where the puzzles that I'm trying to probe live. Up until then, we think we know how to calculate it, and it seems to be neutrons dominating with a little admixture of protons. Thanks. <clears throat> My question is about uh, neutron objects uh, more generally. You got atoms that are half neutrons, roughly, and you got neutron stars that are mostly neutrons with uh, what, an atomic weight of 10 to the 56 or something? 57, yep. 57? Yep. Oh. Giant Gosh. nucleus. <laughs> so uh, is there anything theoretically in between? You know, that's a super question. And I, my personal guess would be no, because the key ingredient that takes you from normal atoms with atomic masses getting up to only, well, people are pushing it up closer to 300, but still 250 or so. Getting it up to the 10 to the 57 requires another force. And that force is gravity. And unfortunately, gravity is so darn weak that it takes a lot of stuff getting together to make it do anything whatsoever. It seems the lightest neutron star you can make, theoretically, I don't know how to make it in the real universe very well, but the lightest one you could make is just under a tenth of the solar mass. So between about a tenth of a solar mass and the mass of the heaviest transuranic nu nu you know, nucleus, I do not know any way of having stable nuclear matter, which is a pity because the engineering things you could do with such stuff are fantabulous. <laughs> Maybe okay. someday we'll figure out how to do it with a new force of some sort, but at present, sorry, I don't know of one at least. I'll work on it. Yeah. Good. <laughs> is the spinning up by the, is the spinning up of the star, neutron star after it uh, takes in the matter from the partner star, is it caused by when the mass is drawn in by the neutron star, it spins up faster, like, when you draw on your arms while you're spinning, you spin faster? Or is it actually caused by the particles physically hitting the neutron star? Well, it's a combination of the two. But the first thing you pointed to, drawing in your arms and spinning up, is really the key. After all, the binary star system itself, the companion, was orbiting. So it had a certain amount of what we call angular momentum. But as that material goes from the outside of the orbit and falls in towards the star from distances the size of the sun, down to distances of the size of a city, that's an enormous pulling in of your arms, and correspondingly, it's an enormous increase in spin rate. So I really think that your simile of the ice skater pulling in their arms to spin up is probably the key one. 
as the material falls in, for a given amount of angular momentum, as it gets closer and closer, it's got to spin faster and faster. That's what brings the neutron star up to millisecond periods by adding a few tenths of a solar mass. I think we're set there, so I, we have a final question. Not exactly a final question for me, but it's the last one I'll ask tonight. Okay. <laughs> Did, what the source of the gamma rays, because that seems like what is very important to be measured, is that just the acceleration of the matter as it in the accretion? Or why, why are gamma rays so um, prevalent from neutron stars? Golly, I would love to talk about that since that's the main theme of my research. But that's a tough, very mathematical subject. But I can tell you in a word or two the ba basic story. It's actually not directly the accretion. Indeed, if stuff is still falling on the star, it seems to poison the gamma ray machine and stop it from emitting gamma rays at all. It's only when that accretion stops and you're left with the bare flywheel with the magnetic field that that unipolar inductor process we talked about, a spinning conducting sphere, can turn the B field, the magnetic field, into an electric field and that electric field can take charged particles and accelerate them to enormous energies, thereby producing gamma rays. It's very much like you're having a slack in the sky that's spinning around really fast. The power source is that flywheel. The coupling is the magnetic field. And you've got to keep that coupler pretty clean, or you take the gamma ray process and shut it off, and you end up with measly, boring x-rays. <laughs> OK, I think that's it. So I thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Drive carefully, and we'll see you in February for the Lick Crisis. <laughs>